Welcome to this week's episode of the Real Wealth Podcast. In this episode, we are going to be talking about the Scottish rental revolution. I'm joined by my business partner, Connor Tracy, and we're going to be talking about the massive opportunity there is in buy to let in Scotland now. Connor, welcome. Thanks, Alex. It's good to be back on. Looking forward to this one as well. And, and this is a, a topic today that is very close to our heart. Um, we recently launched a webinar on the Scottish rental revolution our business has changed massively over the last year, all because of the economic environment that's been created in Scotland. And as ever, big change equals big opportunity. It's just making sure that you're on the right side of it. So we're going to talk a lot about what we see as the opportunity in the Scottish rental market. Yep. We're going to talk about the dynamics that we discuss within our Scottish Rental Revolution webinar and some of the successes we've seen this year because we've got clients doing big things in buy to let this year so I, th I think it's worth a few shout outs there absolutely it's an incredibly unique time um, in the scottish property market um especially for those who want to fully adapt and understand how they can take advantage of it because there's a lot of various circumstances that we kind of touch on that have found us in this position where there's some serious opportunity to capitalize yeah. um, and that's what we're trying to do with our clients and and it was the main reason for the launch of the Scottish Rental Revolution, the webinar, is just to kind of try and, you know, raise the attention to the unique opportunity that exists right now that we've probably never seen before, um, given all the various things that are going on. And that's the thing for us in, in building our buy-to-let portfolio, you know, over the last four or five years, going from zero to 200 properties in our first two and a half years, that, that was all done in the context of a relatively strong market. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which which makes it even more challenging. But now, for the first time, really since our business started, we are seeing the opportunity of a, of a decline in market and challenging conditions, which, as anybody who, who listens to Warren Buffett and, and his, his, you know, his core principle is, is to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, just now everybody's scared. Absolutely. Massive opportunity. So So let's talk about some of the dynamics. Before we get into... The opportunity let's talk about the dynamics that have created this situation just now in scotland yeah i mean there's multiple factors if you look at it kind of all stems back from covid really um where essentially our core business grew and um, you know at that time nobody really knew how that was going to plan out everybody actually expected covid to cause a crash in the market and they thought it was going to be negative and it did the perfect complete polar opposite to that where there was just so much buyer demand um, and lack of stock available that things went for stupid money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the fact that we grew our business within that time in a very competitive market, you know, it's it's kind of crazy thinking about it. But off the back of that, as more money's kind of flooded into the market now and mm -hmm. they're trying to increase the costs of borrowing, the property market itself has kind of slowed down. Um, and you can see that across the board. You know, we've obviously got the estate agency and we've got the auction now as well. And... You know, things are even discounted stock. So mm. most of the things that we'll do are, are still positioned to move quickly. And we've got some properties on at like 20, 30 grand discounts from Home Report that are still not getting that much interest. Yeah. Um, you know, in good areas as well, you know, nice properties, nothing with any issues. It's just that, you know, there's not that much of an appetite for people because of costs so of borrowing. There's, there's a lot of fear in the market. Yeah. You know, cost of borrowing is one element, but... You know, I think over the last couple of years, we've seen probably the most complicated set of dynamics in the economy that we're likely to see in our lifetime. Yeah. You know, we had COVID, uh, an unprecedented situation that, again, probably the only time I hope we're going to see this in our lifetime where the economy shut down for a period of time. A huge amount of money was created by the government to see us through that time. Which, which created this weird dynamic of nobody can do anything and they're pumping a shed load of money into the economy, but they can't spend it. So by the time you get to COVID, you've got this huge amount of pent-up demand to to release, and that's where we've seen a, a massive increase in the market coming out of COVID when everybody kind of expected the, the converse situation. Yeah. Added to that Brexit, you know, yeah. we, we threw that in the mix during that period. Which, which goes, which goes uh, you know, that actually gets missed a lot of the time because I think whether strategically or not, they used COVID to kind of mask how much of a disaster that whole Brexit situation yeah. ended up being. Um, 
that it's an important one to highlight that because we, we, we particularly we seen it on the HMOs with the workforce mm -hmm. you know the change in dynamic there um, ended up being more demand but from a different area you know because of what we've got but uh, it definitely played a, a key part in all of this mix I mean it's it's it has to have been a massive contributor to the mass inflation that we've seen. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the fact is, it's more uh, it's more costly to, to manufacture and create or import what we need because of the situation we've created with Brexit. There was all these new trades deal that had to be done. It's very unlikely that the European trade deals were beneficial to us in the short term. And, you know, the, the impact of that has to be pushed down to the consumer. Not only that, all the labour that we lost during that period. Yeah. You know, I, I heard numerous logistics companies that just couldn't find truck drivers because they, they lost so many of them yeah. uh, during the Brexit period. Construction companies, massive impact manufacturing, a lot of the lower level maintenance work that, you know, on minimum wage that you really struggle to get British people to do. Yeah just wasn't getting fulfilled we've seen a lot of the care companies th that have actually started bringing people in from africa yep and and we've we've had them in some of our hmos uh, on short-term housing so we've seen it firsthand where they can't afford to pay the prices that the british people want to to do these types of jobs so they have to import labor from from the likes of africa to to get that work done so yeah. it's you know huge impact and as you say really understated um, yeah, I mean, yeah, honestly, the, the whole COVID dynamic changed things uh, in weird ways. Like even taxis, like try to get a taxi now, uh, yeah. like nighttime is brutal. Local taxi companies have got like five, six taxis on the road because all the taxi drivers, when COVID happened, you know, they, they had to do something else. So they started doing things like deliveries, yep. you know, and then the delivery thing, they were making good money doing that and they liked it. It was kind of better hours or whatever. So a lot of them just didn't go back. And now, like the lorry driver thing, they're struggling to get drivers. Taxis were the same, mm -hmm. you know. And there's just it's changed a lot of dynamics in certain areas where it's becoming harder and more expensive to draw people back into those jobs that that you yeah. needed. So two massive impacts on the economy: first COVID, then Brexit, yep. and then just to add a third into the mix, we then had the Ukrainian war <laughs> and and the um the, the subsequent um restrictions on russia that, that were imposed and and the impact that had on utilities energy prices fuel prices massive impact there again and and again a big driver behind a lot of the inflation that was seen yeah and that's why a lot of people talk about rising costs everybody thinks we're just talking about interest rates but mm -hmm. we're not it's like literally everything is more expensive to do now um you know and then you're getting uh, regular reviews on your council tax your gas and el electricity bills you know your utilities are all up like significantly mm. uh, the cost of the same goods that you were buying this time last year is more expensive so it's all these costs which are putting a lot of strain on people and the first thing that they often turn to is well we need to move and get a cheaper profit well and and this this is an interesting point though because you know we you raised interest rates there and is it not the case that interest rates now are just at a point where they're normalizing and what we've been used to uh, really, since the majority of our our, our adulthood, certainly yours, may, maybe not quite mine, but from yeah. 2008, the interest rates have been at a level that they could not sustain in the long term, right? Yeah. I mean, 0.25% interest rate is not a true reflection of where the economic stability should be, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, you know, that, that impact of 2008, they've created this artificial scenario that has led to significant increase in the property market over that time, but it was never sustainable in the long term, it had to be normalised. And what you've had for a long time is people essentially living in houses that long term they couldn't afford because the interest rates had to go up. Yep. And that, that's the thing. You see a lot of people complaining about the rates right now because they've never understood it to look back the way and see what they were in the 90s, you know, what, yep. what the costs at that time were. And they've only kind of just seen it and say, oh, I see a big, you know, spike in the cost right now. But that is, it's normalizing. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I took a mortgage out of my house and I fixed it at 3.04 for five years. And mm. my, you know, my parents were telling me that was expensive. Mm. And I was just like, you've not got a fucking clue what's coming. Like, yeah. you know, that that wasn't expensive at all. Mm. But then I hear people think, what is actually, he's only something like one point something. Yeah. You know, and, and to him at that time, it probably seemed expensive for a fixed deal. But it's not. That, that was cheap. 
And the interesting on shoot, and I think the natural transition here now is to start talking about the impact of all of that onto the property market. Yeah. The interesting thing for me is because of those low interest rates, rents have been held fairly low. Yeah. You know, mortgage payments have been artificially low for a long time now, and rents haven't risen in line with inflation as they should have yep. over the last 15 years. So what, what we're seeing now is, is an impact of, of inflation, the interest rates hiking, and, and really a catch-up from this artificial scenario that's been created over the last 15 years, plus these three major events that have happened in the last two, is things are starting to go up exponentially, right? R rents are starting to go through the roof. And, you know, I go back to when I was first looking for a property uh, to, to live in, 21 years old, I was still at university, I had a part-time job, uh, and I toyed with the idea of rent, and I ended up buying a place on a 100% mortgage guaranteed right. by my parents, and it was fantastic because it grew like 20 grand in two years, yeah. I was, and I sold it just before 2008 crash. Anyway, the point was I was looking for somewhere to rent yeah. in Falkirk, and a two-bed flat, was costing somewhere in the region of £450 a month back in 2008. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to when we started in property five years ago, two-bed flat slogan was price. still £450 <laughs> a month. Aye. And it's like, you know, you've, you've, you've moved on 10 years since then and the, the, the rent hasn't moved. How is that possible? Yeah. It's possible because interest Cost rates are artificially low. low. Yeah. I, I, but now what you've seen as as the market starts to normalise is you've got 15 years worth of inflation to catch up with on the rent. Absolutely. So so mortgage payments are going through there, but rents have to as well, you know, but landlords have to continue to make money, so rents are going... It, it, it's just this process of being zoomed in, though. Like you're, only, you're getting people commenting and only analysing the last three years mm -hmm. and thinking that all this madness has just happened. Yep. But if you zoom out, you can mm -hmm. see that actually it should have happened gradually over that time but it didn't from multiple factors. Now there's a lot of things that have happened that have kind of forced it all to happen very quickly. Yep. But we're probably at the natural rate of growth that those rents should be at. It's just we're seeing it in a very condensed period. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one of our clients, you know, has just got a three-bed flat in, in Falkirk and, you know, 975 a month. That, mm -hmm. That's what you're talking for this ex-council property. Your yep. property is only worth about 100 grand. You know, and you're getting 975 a month now for a three bed, and we're talking like 2020, 2021, mm. two bed was still 450. Well, we've recently uh, concluded on a deal for one of our, our, our partnership clients, um, Scott, uh, in Wallace Street. And that was one that really stuck out to me that you told me about was when we first analysed this deal and the end rental value of the property, and yeah. that was only a matter of months ago. Yeah. It was at 1100 1100 and And now, as we stand today, the expected rent is somewhere in the region of 15, 1500 a month. Right. That's a 400 quid a month <laughs> increase in a matter of months. Yep. I mean, it's just staggering. It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and, you know, that one benefits from its location. You know, it's a G5 postcode. It's on the outskirts of the city centre. But still, you know, to go from that rate of growth and... Some things I was looking at, I was speaking to an old client at the weekend before me about a three-bed house she owns in Kilmarnock, and she's had a long-term tenant in there. And again, her comments were, I've had a mortgage on it for a while now, um, yeah, I've got it in a fixed rate, so my price is low, um, but it's due to expire next year, I've got a tenant on it 580. I've just no bothered to increase it because I was making a couple hundred pounds a month. Mm. That's their view is, they're still making money, so why should they make it more expensive? And now they're in a position where they can't increase the rents because that's another factor that the Scottish government's put in. But those same properties are renting for over £900. Mm. Now she has not kept up with the market rent and now she's found herself in a position where her mortgage is now going to go up to a point where she's going to lose money every month yep. because she's not kept tabs on it. But she's not a professional investor. Mm. She just bought an extra property for income. Yep. That's all she'd done it for. She thought it'd be good for her pension, but there was no... No strategy behind it, yeah. And, and and this really is a market where, you know, whilst we talk about the fantastic opportunity that, that it has, this isn't a, a market you can go out to as an amateur, you know, it's, it's complex, it's difficult, it's a massive opportunity, but only if you play the game correctly. And that's the key thing that I say to everybody who's bashing the SNP and the government just now, saying that the government's trying to ruin by a you can't make money in it anymore. Um, you know, they're trying to force, punish landlords and force them out of the market. That isn't actually true. What they're trying to do is they only wanted to be professional landlords. 
because they're sick of the amateur landlords not taking care of the properties and they're the ones who will buy up the extra property. But actually, there's still loads of undersupply because it's not a professional approach. So they're just trying to minimize the landlords to those who actually know what they're doing in a professional capacity. Yeah. So those who want to play the game like that are the ones who can take significant advantage of the of what's available right now. And and you know, because of the lack of professionalism within the buy to let market, again, that's another massive opportunity for us uh, as professional landlords because there's so many people that have got themselves in a mess. Yeah. That want out. Exactly, because it's when we talk about people doing it professionally, we don't just mean that you know that you must be some sort of slum landlord and you don't take care of your tenants or your property. It's the strategy behind how are you contr- controlling your buy to let business? Because if your costs are going up and you've not been monitoring the income, if it was a different business and your overheads were increasing but your revenue was decreasing, yeah, that's not professional. You would, you're no. not going to run a successful business that way. It's the exact same for buy to let is if you're not controlling what the cost of your borrowing is compared to the income that each property is producing, yet, mm-hmm. you're going to find yourself in a, a situation where that business needs to get shut down because yep. you're losing money month on month. And we're finding so many people in that position because they, they simply haven't paid attention. Yep. They've not followed and controlled their business correctly. That's it. That's it. And so let's let's circle back then to the direct impact that all of these different factors have had on the Scottish rental market, right? So yep. we've got all of the economics of COVID and um, Brexit and, and the Ukrainian war pushing up inflation. The only way the government knows how to control inflation is by pumping up interest rates. Yep. Obviously, interest rates have a direct effect on the buy let products. And we're seeing buy let products that you maybe could have got around the four four and a half percent mark a couple of years ago you're now talking more like six and a half yeah. although they're starting to come down a little bit stabilizing a little bit yeah um because we've managed to it appears we've managed to get inflation under control yeah um but nobody really knows I, and i'd be very shocked if this isn't a, a longer term economic challenge you know because the way that i look at this is we're really paying for 15 years worth of fucking shit now yeah you know the the 2008 crash didn't hit most as it should have and a lot of people benefited from those low interest rates long term yeah now it wasn't like most people were banking the money they were probably just living in a house that was a bit too big for them yeah. because they could afford it because of the low interest rates now that's causing them problems but they had this artificial loan inflation rate and uh, interest rate for 15 years which meant they got the benefit of it. So we've not really paid for the 2008 crash fully as we should have. We then hit COVID, huge amount of money that's been printed. That's going to have to be paid back effectively. Um, You know, and and then we've got Brexit and and the economic uh, challenges that that brings. Again, that's all getting paid through through significant inflation just now. Um, So you've had those factors, you've had the impact, now the impact on the Scottish rental market is we have higher interest rates. Rents are starting to go up significantly. However, there are significant rent control measures in place. Yep. That's the challenge for many existing landlords, which is not necessarily a challenge for anybody coming into the market. It's a massive opportunity because rents are going up so much. Yep. If you are an existing landlord with an existing tenant, the Scottish government put in uh, restrictions during COVID where where it was very difficult to get anybody out of their property. Uh, you couldn't increase rents. And then unlike the, um, the, the the English rental market, Scottish government continued with those restrictions yeah. for another, now it's 18 months beyond the, the COVID issue. Uh, they're now at the kind of legal limit. They can extend this situation without changing the law. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do on the run up to to March next year. But they've they've created a situation where there is massive pent up demand for increasing rents, evicting tenants. Uh, people have got away for a long time without paying the rents. Yeah, you know it's killing a lot of non professional landlords. Um, and now there is massive undersupply in the market of rental property because it's all tied up with these people that aren't even paying their rent and you yeah. can't get them out. Um, 
So, you know, you've got a really different, interesting set of dynamics going on in the market. There's all the big scale stuff that you mentioned that affects basically worldwide, but Scotland in particular has its own set of unique circumstances with the decisions the government has... Well, yeah, I mean, the government have essentially escalated yeah. an already challenging situation with yeah. with the measures that they've put in place. D- different. But now, now it's a case for the Scottish government where they need to shit or get off the pan. Exactly. You know, they can't legally keep extending this, this artificial scenario they've created where... There's a huge backlog of ev- evictions to be done. There's a huge backlog of rent increases to be done. Anything that goes on the market that's not got a tenant in it, the rents are going through the fucking roof. Because if, if a landlord's got five properties and he's got three three tenants stuck in on these low rents that he can't increase, but he's got two new empty properties, yep. he's going to hike up the rents on those ones to help pay for the ones that, that are being uh, sec- uh, essentially subsidised by that landlord. And the nope. tenant has to pay the prices yeah. that he asks for. Because, because it's all that's available. available. Exactly. You know? And what the, what the government hasn't recognised, or what they have started to recently, because they're now, some councils are doing incentives of like offering to pay you know, six months rent for these people if we don't kick them out, is they basically overnight told people if you don't pay your rent, there's nothing that can happen to you. Mm-hmm. Eventually, you'll be put out, but there's nothing that can happen. So people have just went, all right, well, I'm not happy about this. And we've seen it when the announcements uh, went out, I think, on our own. Our uh, arrears like, tripled over yep. like, a, a period of time after that announcement because people mm-hmm. were basically being told, you're protected. Yep. Now, eventually, these people will be kicked out. Where does the government think that these people who now have a track record of not paying their rent where are they going to go? Because mm-hmm. there's going to be a homelessness issue if you don't have somewhere for them to go. Yeah. And if their history is that they didn't pay rent for months, who's going to want to take them on? And the costs are going to be significant. Well, the, 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 there's, there's an interesting dynamic with this as well because, yes, you've got that situation where the government effectively said they could get away without paying the rent for, for a period of time and not get evicted. Uh, and they've extended it and extended it. Yeah. But also these tenants, a lot of them might be on universal credits and, and the government made the switch a few years back where it's essentially the housing allowance would be paid directly to the the tenant yeah. or, or the person on, on universal credits and they were to be responsible for their own money. So they've been taking all this money from the council and a lot of them, and we, we see live situations in this, they're not passing the money over no. to the landlord, they're just keeping it and spending it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's taking money directly out of the council's pocket. Yep. And and they're not spending it on what it's, it's supposed to be. So so they've they've made a, a, a difficult situation even worse yep. th- through the decisions that they've made over, over the last little while. And a lot of the instances now we require any tenants on universal credits sign over the, the, the rent to be paid directly because... Because then if they refuse, mm-hmm. you know that something bad's going to come because why would yeah. they not want their rent just to be taken? And then, then they don't need to worry about exactly. it. Exactly. You know? And it's creating, supposed to create fiscal responsibility for these guys, but the reality is most of them just don't pay it in their pocket. Yeah. Maybe most of them is a little bit unfair, but there are a decent there proportion are. of them. And, and we see this every week. So um, we've done a lot of work to, to sort our arrears, but we're not really talking so much about the, the challenges for existing landlords. And they're there. We we have over 200 properties. They are absolutely there. We're now starting to see our rents coming up. We're stabilizing yeah. our interest rates. Things are starting to get a bit more interesting for us on the buy-to-let front, but it has been a difficult couple of years. But all of that has created challenges for existing landlords, which yeah. means people who want to get into the market now have a massive opportunity, you know, Interest rates are stabilizing. Rents are going up significantly, more than offsetting the interest, the higher interest rates, which effectively are just normalizing. I, I wouldn't expect interest rates to be any lower long term than sort of three and a half, four percent. Yeah. Um, but we can make good money as landlords based on the higher rents, which again are just normalizing from fifteen years worth of pent up uh, increases that that won't get made. Uh, and and now you've got this massive opportunity of below market value properties because. As you say, good properties at decent discounts are not shifting just yeah. now because people are scared of the market. They're scared yeah. of the SMPs and the actions that they've taken. They're scared of the interest rates. And a lot of people don't realise that, that this economic situation always has a, a yin and a yang. You know, the, the yang is 
increasing interest rates, the yang is increasing rents. Yeah. And and actually the, 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 the rents are increasing quicker than interest rates. Exactly. And because of this fear, the people are just sitting there not wanting to commit because they think, well, let's just see how it pans out. Let's see if the interest rates come down. And you hear it all the time. And it's like the more people who sit on the sidelines, the less buyers there is in the market, which means the sellers have less people to consider offers for. And therefore, it's like, well, these five people aren't even offering. We already offer, but this is our price. Mm-hmm. They don't have anything else to really compete against. So yep. they're having to accept it because they can't sustain the pressures of the costs and, and where they're at. Or simply that they want to move on with their life and they have no alternative option. If you are a landlord that bought properties in maybe 2008 onwards up to about 2016, bought them in your own name, um, you maybe didn't buy them at much of a discount, you haven't had significant rental increases because most people haven't during that period. Yep. Uh I don't know how you can survive unless you were fixed in a really long term fixed rate uh, and you're not on variable. If you're if you're on variable, your rents haven't gone up. You're stuck with tenants in there, and you know you you've bought at a fairly high price with so refinances off the cards. We're, we're seeing this situation time and time again, yep. and yep. you're having to pay a big tax bill every year, even though you're not making any money because of Section Twenty Four. That is a scary situation to be in, and it's a situation we see a lot of people in. Yeah, but some of the big portfolio landlords as well um, that have just accumulated in their personal name because at the time that's what was the right thing to do, yeah, before they changed the legislation. And, you know, guys with like 40, 50 units are all in that position where every month they are losing money. Every month their tax bill grows. Mm. Like, it's a mess. And it's, you know, I really do feel for the guys, but it's just part of the game like yeah. it, it's just where it is they wanted to build this big multi-million pound portfolio that they thought would take care of their life but they kind of went into it blind just mm. being told this is a good thing to do yeah with no strategy no professional approach not understanding what they were doing but at that time you know 2007 on the lead up to the crash in september 08 you were just getting money from like nothing like yeah. everybody and anybody could just get loans from the bank to buy property because for whatever reason they thought it was only going one way, um, and it just doesn't work like that. It, it's it's like you know mass hysteria of forgetting history. You know it's like well, <laughs> the property market goes in cycles. Except that it's always going to go yeah. crazy and then drop and then go crazy and then drop. It's just how it works. Yeah, you know, uh, you know it's it's the very basic strategy of buy low, sell high, and and we done it um, last year and the year before with some of the assets because we've seen significant growth and we knew this market's nuts. We're seeing properties that typically wouldn't move are going for 20, 30 grand above home report valuation. Our debt's only 75%. Mm-hmm. Well, let's sell it. But we didn't just sell it to then have cash and do what we want. We released the cash because we knew that there was buying be, opportunity uh, there's going to be a buying opportunity coming. And that's what we've done. You know, we've gone through another portfolio refinance at the moment with the view that we want to accumulate a lot more because we're buying them at significant prices that, okay, it might not look attractive for us in the next year or two value-wise, mm. but we're buying them at, say, 60% of their current value in 10 years' time. You know, it could be a very different story as to where we're sitting. Um, and that's what we're trying to get people to recognise is that buy to let is a longer-term play. Mm. It's not about the next 12 to 18 months. It's about what happens in the next 5 to 10 years. Yeah. But people sitting on the sideline, they'll never see any benefit. So it's about recognising, right, I can take this. And as long as I'm thinking, you know, years and not months, Mm. there's some serious money to be made. Uh, When we first started this business, this was the time we've been waiting for. Yeah. You know, we, we managed to scale our portfolio through a relatively strong market because we were acquiring portfolios, which are harder to sell. It's not mass market stuff. So that mass market hysteria of closing dates and 30, 40% over home report doesn't happen at a portfolio level because you've got concentricity. The banks won't lend as much on it. You know, there's yeah. there's always a few angles to get a, a discount on a portfolio. That's how we managed to scale a strong um, market. But now we're seeing a, a very, very weak market and economic conditions which are very challenging yep. leading to a massive opportunity within the Scottish rental market right increasing rents stabilizing interest rates huge amount of bull market value opportunity and massive demand for rent 
rental properties. Yep. You know, I, I mean, any time we've got a property coming on the market, it's gone within a week because there's just huge, huge demand. Um, so, so really now is is an incredible opportunity that we've we've not seen. This is our first market cycle. So it's really cool to see, like, we put a few assets for sale a couple of years ago that flew out the door for way more than I thought they would. And similar types of assets going up for sale right now, there's just fuck all, zero interest. Exactly. Zero interest, even if it's discounted. Yeah. And and that property, those properties haven't changed. Nope. The only thing that's changed is people's view on them and the affordability of the interest. Yeah. And and for me, affordability isn't even an issue now in the rental market because rents are going up. So Exactly. You know, that's the thing. It's like these same assets, they actually will produce more income because the rental figures have went up, but mm. yet they still won't shift because people are scared. They, they don't quite understand what to do and people are being told that, you know, stay away from buy to let right now mm. because of costs. Yeah. But they're not thinking logically about the setup that exists right now. And we are, I mean, we are doubling or even tripling down if you want to say on every element of our business right now especially in the sourcing side because of the unique position we're in and if we, if i do that correctly you know the next three years we could probably make like the money we need for the rest of our life if we do it right because of this unique opportunity yeah and and that's it for us we have to make the most of this situation of course as, as does as does anyone here is a huge opportunity get on board get into it take advantage of it while it's there yeah and and ultimately that's how the majority of people create significant wealth is is by looking for the opportunity and capitalize it, it comes down to your, your professional strategy you know in, a, in an upward trending market flips are great right because you've got so much buyer demand things are going for silly prices even if you overspend or your refurb goes off a little more or you pay too much for it it's okay because you were still seeing it on the back end of it Yep. You know, and it was just mad, especially post COVID. People made a lot of money on flips, you could literally flip anything. In fact, we did cause clients of mine bought stuff like two, two bed ex council flats down in Ardrossan that you would be lucky to get a tenant in sometimes. And they were making 10, 15 grand buying them, open market, tarting them up and reselling them what? because of the market that was existed at that mm -hmm. moment. This is a very different market. That game's not there to be played right now. What is there to be played is to accumulate in mass and hold until we're back at that stage. Accumulate a significant discount. Yeah. And that's where we get into the professional buy-to-let strategies, right? So, you know, everybody's heard of the BRRR model. You yeah. buy it, you refurb it, you rent it out, and you refinance it to pull out your money. Now is an incredible opportunity for that just now. And we see this because we have our own business that, that, that sources below market value properties for us and for our clients. Yeah. Uh, and we buy homes in Scotland. We work with a lot of the national companies that do that as well. And, and we deal with a lot of their stock in Scotland. There is so many deals going out there. Because as you say, things are going on to the open market in good condition at a fair price, even discounted. And it's still not selling because nobody yeah. wants to buy. Uh, you know, if you can get yourself in a situation where you can start to accumulate these below market value assets and the banks are still lending, it's, it's not yeah. like you're, you're going to the banks and they're saying we're not touching it. It's not like the valuations are coming back, you know, ridiculously low. We, we've had a bit of funniness with with some of the valuations recently, yeah. but we, we're still having properties value higher, higher as exactly. well. You know, and, and again, we, we always make this point and buy to let is, you know, if if you do your first deal and the valuation comes back, well, that's a problem. But if you're doing five or six deals, I guarantee you, you'll have some that come back higher, some that come back lower, and it's just the game. It averages out over the long term, but it's all about volume and, and doing more. Yeah, you, you just don't stop. It's only the next one. You know, if you stop, you die. That That's kind of how it's, you know, the, the kind of rule is you may have leave more cash in in the first one than you maybe hoped. Mm -hmm. But if you stop, then that's your only result as a yeah. negative one. You do the next one, you could be cash up and actually you're, you're in a better position just by continuing. Um, those who don't have a long-term view of buy to let is I just want to have a couple of properties. Those are, You will be in the same position as all these other landlords that we've spoken about where you cannot sustain it. it, it, it buy to let only works at scale. And the faster that you can grow, the quicker you'll see the benefit of it. I mean, the, the, the very lowest level buy to let, you really have to do it through a limited company. It depends on your own personal tax situation but yeah. for nine out of ten people it's going to be through a limit company and you need to produce a set of accounts annually so unless you're a chartered accountant 
you know, you're going to be paying a couple hundred quid a month yeah. to get to get your uh, to get your accounts done. If you've only got one property in there, that's going to be most of your net cash flow on that property gone to the accountant. Yeah. So really, it doesn't start to get interesting until you've got five plus, and you're exposing your risk as well. You know, you you only have one one tenant stops paying rent, or you get one big maintenance issue, one you know big expensive bill that comes through, and like all your profit bill is lost mm-hmm. from that that property. You know, whereas you have ten, and that happens even across three you're still making money but we don't we don't ever really encounter any clients that just say ah i just want one the reality is most people already start from a position where i'd love to have five or ten or whatever but the limiting belief is i can't finance that yeah i don't have the money for that and and the realization there is that it's a very different game when you're doing it professionally because it's not just the amount of money that you've got in the bank that's going to dictate how quickly you can go your buy ticket. Exactly, yeah. And even if it is, it was just this view, I'll buy one a year, okay? You know, you buy one a year for the next 10 years, still end up in a significantly better position than, you know, 99% of the population in terms of your your, your wealth position and your, your financial security. But that's growing really slow. You know, once you understand how this stuff works, you don't just grow it one a year. Um, but yet so many people will sit there and they'll never own a second property. You know they never they'll never do that, um, and yet I, I'm challenged by that. And it's one of the reasons why we kind of launched the, you know, our support to help people is that it's really easy to actually do it. So mm-hmm. it's kind of confuses me why so many people don't even explore it or look at it as some form of well, it provides some kind of certainty and security that if employment because of the same pressures the economy is under, yeah. your employed role disappears, your income doesn't. Because you built an asset base, and that goes for any asset, not just property. But property is one that you know will typically do well, and it's always in the top list of the wealthy um, as an asset base. And even if you dabble in other things, most people will have a mixture of property and stocks and shares or whatever. I remember looking years ago at the um, the rich list, and I think it was in the Guardian, and it was what they did. And the majority of people at the top of the list were either in property or made the money elsewhere and then invested in property. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's it, it's just a, a, a great way to put your money and grow it in the long term because, you know, we talk a lot about when we're doing investment reviews and uh, sourcing deals for other clients where you say, okay, this is how much money you have to put in, this is how much money you're going to get back at the point of refinance, this is how much money is left in that deal. Yeah. Um, and usually that would be anywhere from nothing to all money out to, you know, maybe five, ten grand left in the deal. Um, but you're not even thinking, and, and you're you know you're looking at your net cash flow, and maybe that's two hundred and fifty to three hundred quid a month. And a lot of people are forgetting about capital appreciation and the loan. Yeah, of course, they are. and the benefits of that, and and the fact that capital appreciation and buying to let is something that you can take advantage of by refinancing down the line, pulling out a bunch of cash, and there's no tax implications of that because yeah. you only ever pay tax on capital appreciation when you sell the asset. If you never sell it, you never pay tax on it. So you can actually track quite a bit of cash through the refinances without even having to pay any tax. That doesn't usually factor into a lot of the focus on an investment because we're just saying, you know, you've you've got a 30% discount, you know, you've put 50 grand in it, you've got 40 back, you've got 10 grand left in the deal, you've got 250 quid, 300 quid a month net cash flow. Yep. Your money's paid back within a matter of years. And, and essentially thereafter you've got a free asset, but you've also created maybe 20 grand worth of equity into your business and you're going to see capital appreciation, which historically has been about 6% year on year, even with relatively modest, small buy-to-let properties. You know? Yeah, and that's the thing though, it's human behaviour for you to focus just on right now, which is why a lot of people are drawn to you know, these strategies like flips where they're going to get the immediate cash and they can see all oh, this works, but then when you get the big tax bill through right off the back of it, it's like, oh, well, I never really made that much money out of it, but I still took me 12 months to realise and, and make that cash. Um, whereas you think about it, every deal that we look at for ourselves and for our clients, buying at discount creates that immediate equity position, right? But the equity is not money for now. I always call it, it's your money for the future because that's the value. Your equity will grow, mm-hmm. right, with the capital growth, but you're creating an equity position, which is your money bank for the future, gives you a value within your business you're then looking at what is that property paying me month on month such so a money from now and then you're looking at what cash have I left in so you're looking at the return on that actual investment and 
to some people, they just simply don't believe the, the idea that you can buy a property for 10 grand. Yeah, that's ultimately what the true cost is, is that you can buy a property for 10 grand or, or less and have it pay you upwards of three grand a year. You know, and that's that's the standard kind of level of deals that we are doing is typically north of 25 to 30% return on your cash actually invested in it. Mm. But when you look at it on paper, you actually have no money left in it because you've created equity as well. Yeah. And so really the, the, the asset has you, not cost you anything. You've banked it. Yeah. You've banked it for the future. But some people struggle to see that because they don't see the money in the bank again. Mm. But it's the point, if you were to go and sell that asset today, that money could be realized and therefore mm. you would have it but you'd be taxed on it. So instead, we leverage against it to grow more, generate more cash flow, and keep that equity position growing over the long term. So I've I've mentioned the, the fact that we are now, because of the market conditions, seeing an unrivaled level of below market value opportunity through our business, We Buy Home Scotland. Yep. A huge amount of leads coming through, lots of below market value deals getting done for ourselves and for our training clients and uh, you know including the portfolio stuff we've done over the last couple of months mm -hmm. as well as all the single deals that we source for our clients there must be we must be cracking on for close to 100 properties traded oh in, in the last five months easy yeah, that's in the last five months but we must be if it's not there or more ryan actually asked me this question he's seen somebody had posted to say that they had sourced twenty million pound worth of property, and they were maybe quite a big hitter. Mm. And I made the point that we did four and a half million pound worth of property in one month this year. Yeah, but yeah, that, I mean, that's the scale that we're operating at. You know, we've got high level clients that work with us very closely who get involved in portfolio deals. You know, because of the amount of portfolios we bought through our growth period. Um, we get approached with a lot of portfolio opportunities because people know we can get them over the line. Yeah. And now we yeah. trade uh, some of those portfolio opportunities onto our training clients and we help them get through the process yeah. and get them yeah. over the line. And within one month, there was like four portfolio deals done with yeah. four of our high-level clients. So, you know, Aberdeen, Peterhead, you know, there was Glasgow stock. There was that amazing little flat in, in Turnberry. Turnberry yeah. You know, that, that one always... Yeah. And that, that, deal, so, like, that, that deal made our client a quarter mil. Yeah, of equity, you know, banked to the future. From the first deal that we've done with them, you know, and this is what we're working with a lot more on these consultancy clients and just kind of what we were talking about with the economy is these businesses that are scaling for unique circumstances, they make their money through doing something else, but then they invest in property because property is going to be the long-term thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of businesses are really successful because of a change in the market like the outliers. Unique set of circumstances at the right time, the right place, that makes this business successful, but that success is not sustainable. Therefore, they want to have a succession plan so that they can use that money they're making right now to build something that will last the time and that will be able to give them the life that they're now accustomed to. Yeah. And that's what a lot of our consultancy clients are finding themselves in is they've got really good trading businesses now. They're making good money and they want to make sure that they protect that money that they're making so that they can sell the business, yep. chuck it, retire, whatever they want to do, but they built something that will see them through long term, through retirement. I think I think that's the interesting thing and it's something that we've experienced ourselves over the last couple of years is when you have a trading business, it's very difficult to create passive a passive situation where, where you can you can not really be involved in the day they run of the, the business, but it ticks along, it makes good profit belly. That is a really hard dynamic, especially with smaller businesses. You know, once you get to maybe 30, 40, 50 million, uh, you have to have a major structure in place to, to get it. But, you know, when when you're kind of operating at that one to five mil level, you know, you're not dealing with huge volumes of staff, huge structures. Yeah. Really difficult to get it to a passive situation. And, and that's why you find a lot of business owners build it, scale it, sell, sell it. And... That means then you have to have some sort of longer term investments to, to repay. And for yeah. some people, that'll be stocks and shares, although equivocally, the return in the long term isn't going to be as good as what you can do in property if you do it professionally. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a similar situation for us. We are heavily involved in our trading businesses day in, day out. Yeah. But we don't take a lot of involvement day in, day with, with our buy to let. It's, it's fairly passive. You can get it to that point if you structure it in the right way. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's the kind of combination of what we're trying to do. And 
I guess when you're kind of looking at these, that we're this unique circumstance that we've got, uh, where we kind of grew this Scottish rental revolution idea from, is that we are creating, like we're scaling our team up massively in our trading businesses because of the opportunity. So we're actually creating employment, new opportunity for other people. We're educating those people on what's going on while they improve their income position mm. to help us as we scale. And naturally, you know, our trading businesses, we want them to be profitable. Of course we do. And maybe may or may not choose to use that profit to then scale yeah. more of our investments. It's unlikely that we wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, but the point is that we're, we're, we're doing it all, you know, the, to make sense of every element. Um, and we're helping other people do the exact same thing. I mean, I would feel like we'd done ourselves and potential clients out there a massive disservice if we didn't give this everything over the next few years yeah. and, and try and open the eyes to as many people as possible of the opportunity that lies underneath all the fear within the Scottish rental market. Yeah. You know, the, the Scottish government have created a mess. There's no doubt about that. There's With, with the restrictions that they've put in place, the... Uh, eviction bans that they've put in they have created a, a mess for a lot of people both tenants and landlords this this isn't just the landlords because the tenants might be reaping the benefits in the short term but i guarantee it will cause them issues yeah. in the long term yeah um the, the the thing is to be able to look beyond that and see the opportunity going forward if you do it right if you do it professionally if you avoid the pitfalls that most people make and that we work very closely with our training clients to assure that they don't make those same mistakes. We yeah. in there, we've done it with it two hundred times over, and and there's very few situations within the the, the rental dynamics that we haven't had Came across. With. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that are kind of sitting there and they maybe don't understand properly, they've heard about it. They probably heard all the negative connotations right now, but they might be sitting there thinking, "Well, I don't have the cash." You know, if we flip that on its head and we discussed an idea that, let's say we had Rolexes that you could buy for a grand right now, are you telling me that you wouldn't find a way to get a thousand pound to buy the Rolex right now, or we were selling Ferraris for five grand, mm. you would do something to find a way to get the five grand to buy that Ferrari, because you know that that Ferrari is worth much more. Mm. That's where we're at right now, is we're able to buy the equivalent of that in property right now. And if you don't have the cash, you will do everything or you should do everything to figure out what strategies you can apply to get the cash so you can take advantage of the opportunity right now. I, I mean, that's what we help people do. Some of the discounts we we're getting on properties just now are just staggering, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. It, it, and it's not not just in shit locations that some yeah. people might think as well. One in Bonesse that we just done there, you know, it was valued at 150 grand, secured it for 100 because it's got a tenant in there at 600 a month and it should be a thousand pound a month. But it, it's a you know it's a thirty percent discount on a four bedroom house yep. that would sell in the open market day one at like that one hundred and fifty k because there's massive demand for that type of property. But the point is you're buying it with the tenant in place. Okay, yep. you're maybe not making money right now, but as that tenant moves on, then you cash in. At, and you know again another false expectation that you know when when you're doing these these types of deals that is always some shithole and some shithole Aye. area, and and it's just not the case. You know we talked earlier about. One of our clients who's buying that portfolio seven includes one a, a flat on the golf course at Turnberry. Yep. You know we talked about Scott at the start of the podcast who's just bought one a property in Glasgow on, yep. in a G five postcode, nice high rise building, security. You know, and and again massive discount on that property. Yeah, yeah, and he'll he'll, he'll create like thirty grand of equity on that. His cash flow will be somewhere in the region of six hundred pound a month, mm. even on these higher rates that that we're getting at the moment uh, with the interest. Um, and that total deal, by the time he's got his cash back out, it'll cost him twelve grand. Yeah, twelve grand being left in to make six hundred pound a month. Like that's wild. And hold an asset in a G five postcode just round from the Barclays building uh, in Glasgow that's just been built. That capital appreciation will come. Yeah, uh, you know, and he always and he's already buying thirty grand worth of equity. Yeah, you know, and, and any capital appreciation going forward is just it's just. And some thought, people yeah. might see that and go, well, okay, well, we could just sell it then. And we're like, okay, he might make 30 grand. But he's making one 30 grand or he can get paid forever. But, you know, you miss, they're missing the point there because the point is you're not getting the value for selling anything. No. Now. No. You know, unless it is prime property in a prime location that has a, a market of wealthy people that have always yeah, got money. There'll always be a specific buyer for the right property at the right time, you know, that certain things are still going to move, but it's certainly nowhere near where we were at 
this time last year or the year before where you've got 20 people all bidding for the same property and they've got excess cash. That's not where we're at anymore. People are watching what they're doing with their money. They're being very picky with what they're buying. And therefore, the rental side of that is that they don't have a choice because there's such a lack of supply, in which case you name your price and tenants are paying it. Your people are actually bidding for rentals. Yeah. You know, you're going on at maybe £900 a month and people are saying, I'll take it at £1,000 a month. Just give me it. We've actually, and, and this is this is a funny switch that's happened, is, you know, when you send a surveyor in to do a refinance on a property, usually your main concern is what is the valuation coming back at? Yeah. Uh, and that hasn't been an issue for us recently. Uh, the valuations have been okay. They've been fine, kind of on par. But what we've found is that the values are not keeping up to date with the levels that rents have gone up. So so we actually had a loan recently where they were going to drop the amount they were lending. It was over seven properties by a hundred grand because they were saying the rents were something in the region of 15 grand a year lower than what we were actually yeah. achieving. So we said, no, no, we've got, we've got the, the tenancy agreements here. Look at them. They're much, much higher than what you're forecasting here. They wouldn't accept that. And then we had to go into appeal and show comparables. And, and those appeals have been held up now, thankfully. But that's the first time we've really come across that situation where because rents are going up so quickly, the values maybe aren't keeping up to date with them. And if your debt service cover, i.e. You, you're not getting enough rent to cover the, the level of interest that they're going to charge on that loan, they're going to reduce the lending. Yeah. So your valuation can be spot on and, and you're still not getting the level of lending that you expect to be because of your rents. The rents are there. It's just moving so quickly just now that the values are struggling to keep, keep up. With it. Exactly, and it's hard to find you know identical comparisons as well and and look at it. Um, even we speak to some letting agents and they give us a price, and then we go on and we see, well, they're saying seven hundred, but I'm on the market now, and there's five properties that are all two bed flats around the corner or within a quarter mile, and they're all rented for nine hundred. Mm -hmm. So yep. we put ours up at nine hundred, and all of a sudden it's occupied inside two days. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so, and and you know this this situation isn't going anywhere. Rents are going to continue to increase. Uh, I think at a rapid speed. The expectation is that interest interest rates should start to stabilise. I'm not saying they're not going to go up uh, once or twice more, but you know we we had our first meeting and in 14 consecutive meetings where they didn't increase the interest rate. So that's a good sign. Uh, yeah. You know, especially with inflation coming down. Let's see where that goes, but. Don't expect interest rates are going to go back to 0.25%. That, no. that was an unrealistic situation for a long period of time. But the point is, if we can make good money on a buy-to-let property now at 6% or 6.5%, rents are only going to keep going up. That level yeah. of debt you've got on, on that property doesn't unless you refinance and, and get the benefit of a, a big chunk of cash coming out tax-free. You know, the, the situation just now is, is a phenomenal opportunity if... If you're getting in from the ground, you, you're going to start buying, structuring it professionally to make sure you're not getting hammered in tax. You're going to understand all the ins and outs of, of what you can do in terms of your rights as a landlord, structure it in the right way, get in with someone who can get you those below market value deals. That is 90% of what we do for our clients is we get them the right deals. We do the refurbs for them. We help them get the finance exit strategy right. We support them through the whole process. And we make sure that they're executing the investment strategy the way they need to be yep. to, get, to get the most equity out of it, the most cash flow out of it, and the best out of their investment in the long term. But if you can do that, there, there is unlikely to be a better opportunity than right now and within the next 12 years. I, I mean, your average cycle is normally about 12 years. We, we're not going to see this again for a long, long time. So if you're not thinking seriously about getting into buy to let just now, you're missing a huge opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it, it, all the clients coming in, we were talking about consultancy clients and successful trading businesses, but clients just getting started, no proper experience and no real capital behind them. We had one of our clients, Fraser, his first deal was a two bed flat in Afton Road in Cumbernauld, which we secured for less than 40 grand. Has an existing tenant, thinks she's paying 390 a month just now, should be up at 650 uh, for this two bed flat in Cumbernauld now. But those properties are selling on the open market for 80 grand. Yep. He's bought it at half its value because he was willing to take it with the tenant. Now that tenant's actually now looking to move on. Mm. So in the space of a couple of months, he's just bought this property at 50%, 50 pence on the pound. And he's going to make monthly cash flow 
and he's going to bank all that equity. But it, I mean, hold hold up on that a second though. You know, you say you're getting that that massive discount to forty grand because yeah. a tenant's paying three ninety a month. Yeah. That's still a twelve percent yield, more or less. Even if he doesn't do anything oh, and he just sits oh, there on the value, you know. Yeah. So it's still it, they've made it an attractive investment because of the level of discount. Yeah. Anyway, even without getting that ten now, yeah, you get them out, put it to six hundred. That is insane. Like, and if you're open to that, you know, our other client, Dean, he bought one up in Aberdeen that we secured for him, paid forty grand for a flat that's worth sixty five. Again, existing tenant paying four fifty. Mm-hmm. So he's got £450 a month on his 40k Now we just bought it cash mm-hmm. So he's just getting that return on the cash there Rather than sitting in the bank But what we've now done is we've leveraged against that flat To help him buy two more yep. So his income is now going up to nearly £1,000 a month His equity is improved And he's done nothing else apart from make a move on buying Aberdeen flat yep. That's helped him structure his business uh, people will be genuinely shocked at how far you can go and and buy to let using the strategies that we we teach with, with a relatively small pot of funds yeah. it, it, or or none at all and just leveraging the finance strategies that we teach to, yeah. to massively grow. L- Laurie and I, when we first started buying, we spent all of our money or all of our personal cash on building our own portfolios. I had six, he had ten. Uh, we didn't start root group with with any funds in the bank you know we had to find investors we we had to use the financial strategies that we teach so you know we're we're coming from a position of having built 13 and a half million dollars (laughs) in america 13 and a half million pounds worth of assets off the back of 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 very little cash to start with and, and raising private investor finance as well as SaaS financing as well as credit card strategies as, as well as highly leveraged acquisition finance all the strategies that we talk about in our training you know we've done it all and yeah. and you have to do it all to scale as quickly as we did not everybody wants to go that quickly yeah. but even getting to 10 in the first year massive achievement uh, what we aim to uh, to achieve with our consultancy clients uh we aim to get to five with our partnership clients um those those results are very much within the reach of the average person just by implementing the strategies. Yeah. So Absolutely. that that's we've been giving you a flavour of the Scottish rental revolution, the massive opportunity that's here and what we're doing now to leverage it. We we are going to be rolling out this Scottish rental revolution web webinar on a regular basis. Um so I'm gonna leave in the show notes a link to the Scottish Re- Rental Revolution website. Uh, so keep an eye out there for new dates. We're trying to get the word out on the massive opportunity that there is in the buy-to-let market in Scotland just now. If you do it right, if you do it professionally, and the opportunity that we can help you with in, in massively scaling a very, very profitable buy-to-let portfolio that is a long-term investment. There's no get-rich-quick schemes here. Yeah. This is investing for the long term uh, in, in the most professional way. So that has been... An insight in the Scottish Rental Revolution. Thanks for joining me, Connor. Thanks very much. This has been the Real Wealth Podcast. I'm Alex Robertson, and thanks for joining us on this wealth journey.